Artie Moses back again. We've got the Army of Missouri, Grant's Expeditionary Corps, the Department of the West, Department of Missouri, rather, and Fremont's Frontier Division. A couple of pretty big important changes have been made. For instance, we have now researched the reforms necessary, organization reform, to form corps out of our armies rather than leave them as independent forces. The idea behind the corps is that it makes the, the entire force a bit more flexible uh, in its sort of command structure, and it allows uh, better reinforcement, better cooperation between multiple units, that sort of thing. So we are going to reorganize Grant's Expeditionary Corps, uh, and we're going to call it the Army of the Tennessee. So it was historically the Army of Tennessee, as it was historically, and we're going to make uh, Phil Kearney here one of the corps that is going to work within Grant's Army of Tennessee. So let Let's get in uh, and reorganize this. We're going to reorganize Missouri and uh, uh, Fremont's Frontier Division. And uh, like I promised last time and then promptly forgot, uh, we're also going to take a little bit of time and talk about prison camps and prisoners, both historically and within the game. But first, let's go into Grant's Expeditionary Corps here. And you got Grant clicked. After you've researched that project, after you've researched organization reform, you can come down and we can either create a new independent corps, which would mean basically a, an army. So right right now, this is technically an independent corps. But what we want to do is upgrade this corps to an army. And this would essentially put Major General Ulysses S. Grant up in a higher echelon of command. And all of his sub-commanders, will, then we can attach into these, these uh, corps as a corps commander. Uh, underneath Grant. So we're going to click this right here. So again, upgrade core to army right there. So Grant's Expeditionary Corps is now the army. An army, so I'm going to call it Army of Tennessee. So the Army of Tennessee. So we want we want to keep this like it is, right? Because if I were to, I could, if I wanted to, add a new group. And what that would do, I'm going to do that real quick, and then I'll delete him. Well, what that would do is add the first core under Thomas Williams. And I could take Crook and Hancock and Doubleday, and I could put them under the first core, which would leave Grant's sort of headquarters division, headquarters core, headquarters army, um, its own different place on the map. Uh, and what I mean by that is, all right, so if I delete him, right, first core, he's gone. So if I close this, we have Grant's Expeditionary Corps, now called the Army of Tennessee. If the game refreshes, there we go. Uh, the Army of Tennessee, so this is still a single army, a single unit in a single army, right? Um, and he can move around just like he had been before. Um, and, you know, it's got the same strength, got everything else. Um, but it is labeled as an army. So if I go back up to Manage Army, and we're going to want to get Kearney involved in this cool party over here. So we find Phil Kearney, right? If we drag Phil Kearney over here and put him under Grant, that will make, uh, if we can get rid of this transfer page, that will make Kearney's force, the Army of the Missouri, the first core, technically the second core, of Grant's Army of Tennessee. So I'm going to rename the Army of Missouri as the two core a o t so when we close this right we can still see kearney's force over there and now it is all right it will be renamed you know the second core army of the tennessee you can also see that at the army level here this sort of command radius is massively expanded we also have a direct sort of chain of command that goes between Grant and uh, and Kearney over here, right? So this whole thing is now on the same page. When we open this up, we've got Grant's whole core that he's leading personally, and then we have Kearney's second core that is subservient to Grant. And so we can we can arrange this, organize this all on the same page. It makes transferring forces a lot easier, uh, and it makes us able to kind of view this whole thing. So one of the one of the complaints that I had when I when I first 
you know, was playing us way back in like 1.04 or even earlier, was that as soon as you research core, you have these independent little headquarters companies running around the map. But I didn't know that you could literally just attach divisions directly to these commander units. Um, and now that I know that you can do that, you can keep Grant as essentially a core commander as well as the army commander. And with basically an army that's just two core, that's just fine, right? I don't need to make any changes, I don't think, to this sort of order of battle as it stands right now. Eventually, I might add a dedicated cavalry arm as its own independent core. Uh, I might add a sort of division, uh, a, a reserve of artillery in case I get a lot more guns, things like that, right? So right there, we have the Army of the Tennessee. We have the Army of Tennessee now is in its core structure. And we can check out the front lines again, and we're making pretty good progress. We've captured Nashville, took it without a fight. Um, we've got some forces that are going to be down here in Bolivar. So we're going to head down to Bolivar. We're going to head down to Memphis. I think I'm going to get Grant to take the river once again to Memphis. And I'm going to bring Kearney back to cooperate with Grant. Uh, and he's going to move on Bolivar. And, uh, and yeah, so we're going to wait. I don't want to wait the... Oh, it's only three days. I might wait, actually, uh, a few days just to get my cavalry here. Uh, and in the meantime, these guys both have good... I think I'll probably... I might give Robinson the uh, Jocelyn's, just so we can see him in action pretty soon here. Uh, it says upgrade not possible. I don't know why, but it seemed fine. There we go. Okay, so there you have it. I'm going to double check to make sure all of these guys have rifles. Looking pretty good. All rifle. Okay. I would like to upgrade these. I'm still unsure if I have any good ones. I've got some 12-pound howitzers and some 24-pound howitzers. Most of those are captures from the Confederates. Uh, and I don't quite yet. I'm still waiting for a couple of projects to wrap up. This might take a while. 24.6 days, I'll have more 12-pound Napoleons. And in 50 days, I'll have more 10-pound parrots. Looking pretty good. All right, and now that we've uh, reorganized the Army of Tennessee, I want to do the same with the Department of Missouri over here. I'm going to upgrade this to an army. I'm going to leave McDowell in charge of essentially this home guard sort of thing over here, and I'm going to transfer. I'm sure he's going to love it. I'm going to transfer Fremont's Frontier Division to operate underneath Irvin McDowell. Now, he is still technically only a division commander. So I actually don't want to do that. I want to... I'm going to add a new group. And now we have to kind of... All right, let me close this out just so we don't have that transfer page. So if we look at this, I mean, Fremont's still considered a division. Uh, which is a little weird because he's got his own division. But, you know, whatever. Actually, let me... No, he is. Okay. So he is still a, a uh, technically still there, although yeah, he's fine. Yeah, if I were to make um, you know, different if I were to make uh, different units here, uh, another subdivision, another division underneath uh, Fremont, it would show up as its own independent thing. Okay. And yep, it does show Fremont as having three stars up there. So Fremont's Frontier Division uh, is now basically it's operating as an independent corps as part of the Department of the, of the Missouri. But I'm going to change its name. And now it's not no longer a simple division, but it is a corps. Fremont's Frontier Corps. Okay. So that is our, our forces under here reorganized. Um, and for now... That will do it for reorganization. But I did, like I said, I wanted to take the time to talk a little bit about prisons and prison camps. I know that if you start a campaign in the 1.07 patch, it will automatically generate a prison camp, even if you don't build one. Now, building a prison camp is something that you can do. 
right? You can build one for about four and a half million dollars and you can construct it pretty much anywhere. And what that does is essentially the way that the, the war is running now, uh, as it stands at March 30th, 1862, is that after you capture prisoners in battle, you get that little thing that says we've captured so many prisoners, they have been paroled. And parole was a really important part of the Civil War. Um, and I've mentioned before that there were as many surrendered personnel uh, between both sides on the Civil War as there were killed in action. So think about that for a second. Hundreds of thousands of men surrendered pretty frequently, right? It was a huge, huge problem. And parole was a way to take the burden off of the state to feed and house prisoners of war because it's expensive. It's really expensive. Um, you basically have a bunch of guys sitting around just eating and doing nothing. You have to hire other guys who also need food and need pay and all that to oversee them, make sure they don't escape, make sure they're not committing crimes, make sure they're not doing stuff you don't want them to do. And that's super duper expensive. And so at the beginning of the war, both sides essentially paroled quite frequently. We have some letters from WHL Wallace when he arrived in Cairo. When he was transferring his, uh, after he had transferred his 90 day men over to three year contracts uh, in the late summer of 1861, one of the things he was talking about was like keeping himself, like doing that administrative task was hard enough, but he kept getting bothered by stuff that was happening all over the place. And he was the commander of a particular camp after a battle and a Confederate officer came under a flag of truce and asked to exchange prisoners. And Wallace agreed, they exchanged prisoners, and it went smoothly, right? And this was essentially kind of the, the way that it operated. If you captured men in combat, you would take down their names, and you would keep those names in official lists. And as you keep them in official lists, um, anytime you had a prisoner exchange, you could explain, exchange the number of people you have, their names, possibly their units, stuff like that, and they would be exchanged. They'd be free to, to, to fight once again. Until that happened, they had to stay out of combat. And so many of the early prison camps that were formed on the Union side and the Confederate side were not actually camps to house enemy prisoners of war. They were camps to house paroled soldiers until they got exchanged, which is a, which is a weird thing. And it's something that this game doesn't actually model very well. And this system essentially stopped after the Union started using contraband of war as as laborers in their camps and eventually as soldiers and the refusal of the confederate armies the confusion the the refusal of the confederate armies to recognize that these were legitimate either soldiers or laborers in the union army and their refusal to parole them meant that lincoln came down pretty hard on that and said if you are refusing to recognize black soldiers and black laborers as official parts of the army we will no longer exchange prisoners we're going to shove all your dudes in a camp and they're going to stay there till the end of the war and the rebels basically said well okay go ahead and do it we are not going to allow for the existence of black soldiers it's just we're not going to acknowledge them we're not going to exchange them uh if they were if they were emancipated slaves, they're going back to their owners. And if they weren't, they're going to the, to the sales block. Like, that's what they were doing. And so the the end of the parole system was mostly because of rebel stubbornness. They refused to allow the fact that black men could officially serve in the United States Army in any capacity. And that's why prison camps like Andersonville and like other places became so infamous. And a lot of some of the worst prison camps... Uh, in the United States on the federal side saw a lot of the men who, who died in these camps were union men who were waiting for their paroles. Uh, so again, it just speaks to how difficult and how awful it was for to, to keep prisoners or to keep parolees uh, sort of confined before they could go back to the ranks. Um, so I, I always thought that was pretty interesting and it's, it's something the game doesn't try to model and i you don't necessarily think it ought to right it's just it's just something i think is kind of interesting so in any case let us continue i'm going to move the mississippi squadron down here to see if i can see uh what's going on near memphis because obviously it looks like there is a supply depot that's being constructed in bolivar so i assume that our friends from our last battle are down here in bolivar and we're gonna have to move down here and confront them so we're gonna wait for community to catch up to grant and then we're both 
honestly, I, I had all these elaborate plans. I think we're just going to move down and challenge this army. And then we're going to move on Memphis and possibly Corinth as well. Uh, so, yeah, let's uh, let's move her along here. Um, before I do, I'm going to check back east to make sure there's no impending crises. Back here with the Army of Tennessee, um, it's looking like I'm not actually going to split uh, the core uh, and go go over here to Memphis, everything. Um, we've got some pretty big updates to talk about. So we have the Army of Mississippi uh, currently has 8,000 men. Uh, they're, they're going up to 15,000. And the Army of the Mississippi uh, currently has 25,000, and they're going up to 26,000 men. So I'm actually going to need to move both of these forces together in order to... I'm going to wait until they just... Wait until Grant's army just starts moving. About half an hour. And then I'm going to get the second corps to move as well. So they should still reinforce each other. But, you know, there's, there's really no reason to dither. Especially when you're in the presence of two armies that can cooperate together pretty closely. Uh, and steal a march on you, essentially. If I can isolate the Army of Mississippi and defeat that first, and then swing over and attack the Army of the Mississippi, that would be ideal. That would be perfect. Um, as it is, I don't want to do that. Uh, I, I really don't. I would really prefer to deal with one, uh, one at a time. But if I have to fight both of them, I will as well. I've got some weapons delivered. So another batch of 50,000 Springfield rifles have been delivered. I'm going to make sure all of my men here are equipped with rifle muskets. I believe all of them are. Great. That's looking pretty good. I still have quite a few pieces of artillery out there waiting to be uh, put into the hands of my men. Uh, so that remains to be seen a little bit. I think uh, let's check the Department of Missouri here. Nope. Give you a rifle musket. And both of these guys have mixed muskets. Make sure they all have rifle muskets. Um, and also, just to check it out again, so we have um, well, let's let's find one who doesn't. <laughs> or we can just look at the weapons tab. Let's do that instead. Um, we still have 51 days for more Jocelyn's. And our Springfields are now up to 27 production, $486. And for another, if I were to order another 50,000, let's see how long that's going to take. 64 days. So just about, just about where it was last time, I guess. I think last time was with 68 days. So it's reduced by four. It's reduced. Its overall cost is reduced by seven million dollars for that batch of fifty thousand. But again, just about two months, I can have another fifty thousand in the hands of my men, uh, which is pretty good. And again, so okay, it does appear as if the difference is still eight in between the rifle, the Springfield, and the Mississippi. And the Mississippi again, it's still going to cost like. It's still a lot more time to produce. They're still a bit more expensive. But it's... The last time I checked the Springfields, they were at 18 production, and their time, their estimated delivery was a lot lower. So I think, I wonder if the production time goes down with number produced overall. I wonder if that's I wonder if that's part of it. I wonder if it's if it's just a lot more complicated <laughs> than than just this simple kind of number affecting everything. That's probably it. Uh, but in any case, again, that's that's really it's really interesting to know, and it's I think it's useful, uh, especially in planning your campaigns for the beginning portions of the game. All right, but uh, let's get back and see what we're going to get into over here. They are going to withdraw. Wonderful. So if the Army of Mississippi here is going to withdraw and they're not going to challenge me, I'm going to I'm going to turn and march right on the Army of the Mississippi because of again, same reasons. I really do not want to Okay, give me the Army of Tennessee. Uh, I don't want to be in a position where I have to fight both of them 
if I can at all avoid it. I'll wait until Grant just starts moving, and then I'll send the order. I'll send the order now. There we go. Two hours for my second corps of the Army of Tennessee to arrive against 25,000 men and 41 guns. Let's do it. Battle of Purdy, Tennessee, April 12, 1862. And this is another horrible jungle map. I really, really, really dislike fighting on horrible jungle maps. Let's, let's get it going. Um, it's not even, it's, I don't even think it's worth building entrenchments. I'm probably going to have to detach and move my artillery away uh, most of the time. But I do want to leave Grierson and Carlson. Carlton? Carlin? Carlin. I'm going to leave Carlin uh, back here for possible reserve, possible support, that kind of thing. One good thing about this being a horrible jungle map is that it, it will probably fatigue the enemy before they arrive. But that's small comfort. End of the day. I don't... Unless... Well, let's let's cheese a little bit here. Um, sometimes the enemy will they'll make these huge circuitous marching routes, and by the end of the day they'll end up in in some absolutely bizarre position. Um, if I were to guess, yeah, they're still they're still over here. I, I don't know why they waited so long, but it looks like they're still uh, quite quite far over there. So I'll bring them back. And that's sort of just a demonstration of the way that you can kind of cheese a little bit, uh, is just sort of bring your units up to the edge of your deployment zone and see see what's there. Um, you know, I don't think it's that bad. I think honestly, uh, one of the one of the things I, I like the least of this whole game is this tediously long deployment and sort of search and scout phase. Um, I. I the quickest fix, I think, is if they put a 20 or a 30 times speed uh, sort of enhancement, because sometimes the, the AI will goof up, right? They'll just mash into each other in places like this where the terrain is unfavorable, and it'll take literally days for them to actually even, like, deploy and do anything. I'm honestly surprised that my artillery is able to fire at really anything at all. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to be very careful with them and probably withdraw them pretty soon. But for now, I guess I'll just enjoy the bombardment while I have it. Uh, and Anderson is being pretty foolish, so I'm going to go get him. They've got two Andersons. Or they have teleporting men, somehow? I'm not sure what happened here. It said Stevenson in contact, and then the enemy brigade I was fighting 
literally teleported away. Okay. Why not? Nope, there they are, somehow. All right, Colonel William H. L. Wallace with his all rifles about to open up. See if we can break this Anderson Brigade pretty quickly here. Oh, Double Day is way back here. Let's bring Double Day up. Um, and detach the battery because, once again, the battery will be useless. Wallace pushing aggressively, as he should. He's already fired six volleys to the first Missouri's four. I suppose it's not a tremendously huge rate of fire, but... And that is Anderson broken. I'm going to keep William Wallace heading up here on the flank, and I'm going to turn Stevenson to engage straight ahead as well. Again, this is, we have an opportunity here to just sort of take them on in detail. They they had such a messy deployment zone that they probably spent most of that day just trying to get people on this road. And now that they're up on the road, now that they're engaging, I, I have the opportunity, since I was just sitting, to engage them piecemeal, and what, just one at a time. And so that is what I'm going to do. Uh, unless my... Brigadiers, uh, you know, ignore their orders, which sometimes they do. And so, uh, as a as a bit of uh, a tactical question, I'm sure some of you have noticed that I I often get right up into the faces of enemy artillery with my entire brigades and the reason i do that is because one or two pretty solid uh, it volleys from an entire brigade of infantry is likely to break a battalion of artillery uh, especially on broken ground like this there's there's no reason to to waste the time that you're going to need to waste to deploy skirmishers and have the skirmishers kind of get all screwed up because they don't listen to you after they've, given, they've, they've made their initial attacks. And the amount of times that it takes for the artillery to reload and fire more canister, you can basically have put on three or four volleys and utterly break them. So I prefer it to engaging with skirmishers, although if I have the time and if I have the space, I will deploy skirmishers and I will try to get skirmishers to hit the, uh, to hit the artillery. But if I can do it quickly enough, I mean, the first Missouri is taking the brunt of this, and so far they've taken fewer than 30 casualties. So I'm, I'm okay with bringing full infantry brigades up against artillery like this. I feel like walls move a bit faster.
is a broken battalion of artillery. Fifth Indiana made a slight miscalculation on their positioning, so I'm going to order them to withdraw slightly while I wait for Elliot to get into position. Third Michigan out there alone. I want Scammon to get up there quickly if he can. Sometimes even just making these little fine-tune adjustments can make an enormous difference in the morale of your units and the cohesiveness of your units, right? Because they have the debuff, they're fighting an enemy behind cover, and they're falling back under fire, but now they're not. And they are they don't have a flank debuff, and they still have a, a morale buff because they are supported by nearby units. Wallace is in a in a weird position. He's getting a, an exhaustion debuff mostly because uh, he has to wade through this creek in order to fight. Uh, it's such a brutal brutal slog here, just everybody marching through this swamp, everybody moving so slowly. Alright, I'm going to order the first Missouri to lie down. Now they're, now they're really taking quite a lot of artillery fire. Uh, we don't have the, the DPS on that gun that we had in the last time we assaulted one, so hopefully I can break Anderson's brigade, the other Anderson's brigade, and I can get some flanking fire on those on that battery, but until then, I've got to have the 1st Missouri just lie down and try to take it. There we have it. So Anderson's brigade's broken. I'm going to be going to have Burnham get right up on the flank of Smith's brigade. And we'll order the 1st Minnesota to face it directly. And I'm going to get Tidbull right in the teeth What are these guys at double time, but they are very tired. Mostly I just I don't want the first Missouri to break. And I, I'm afraid that if I tell them to get up and draw, uh, they will stand up, take some canister fire, and get badly broken. I don't want that to happen. Get Wallace's men to slew over in front. I can I can withdraw the first Missouri once they stop getting the direct fire from this artillery. But we were lucky we were able to catch their their left flank uh, in the midst of its deployment. They weren't settled, and so we were actually able to kind of get get our, our hooks in over here and take an advantage and just press it. I really want to avoid taking direct cavalry charges. I feel like that is a buff that the AI has been given. I'm not sure if it's just the AI, but cavalry in general seems quite a lot more potent, uh, especially in charges. And so you have to really be careful to, to really watch uh, their their deployment. Because if they, get, if they get a chance to charge an individual unit, they will do it, and they might break it. It looks like we're doing okay. And they are withdrawing. Uh, we haven't been given, you know, they uh, we haven't been told they're withdrawing quite yet, but it's quite obvious they are withdrawing from the field. 
2,600 casualties is pretty good. It's it's not, you know, it's no major victory by any means, but it's pretty good. I'm honestly surprised my artillery is able to fire at all, let alone to have been firing more or less this entire time. Boy, my division commander is really far away. So in their in their withdrawal, kind of taking any of the casualties that we that we can, uh, we've taken very light casualties, which is great. And that's that's nothing to shake your fist at in 1.07. Look at how fast, just how much faster they get to move now. They've really, really buffed the withdrawal. They've, they've made them ridiculously fast. They're broken. Yeah, and I mean, there's no, there's not a chance that I'm going to be able to get uh, a major victory out of this, no matter what. But that's okay. If I were to if I were to force a capture of one of their infantry brigades, I, I may have had a chance, but on this terrain with this army in the defensive posture, there's there's just no way. And we'll see these guys airbend away as soon as I open up on them. Yep. Let's see if we can get a sense of the This is just one time speed. Yeah, just basically sprinting away. And they're just going to keep doing this. They're going to move just outside of rifle range every time. So yeah, this is another change. They've definitely, definitely done this on purpose to make it much, much harder for you to achieve these overwhelming major victories. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's slightly artificial. Nothing you can do about it. But decent battle. Minor federal victory. I'm going to push them away and uh, be able to move on Memphis. Victory at Purdy. Great. Excellently done. We'll watch their retreat path. I wouldn't be surprised if... Did you all see that? <laughs> that movement up the river there? I wouldn't be surprised if they try to move back onto Nashville. And it does look like... I'm not sure where they'd be going, necessarily. But I, as a precaution, I'm going to bring Fremont back to St. Louis as quickly as he can go. And I'm going to send the Department of the Missouri, I'm going to send Urban McDowell to get to Cairo as quickly as he can. Because I really don't want a sneaky little army to come here and capture Cairo just because they can. Um, that that reminds me of back in the olden days, back before the even the 1.06 patch, 
where the retreat paths of the enemy would sometimes like retreat behind you and walk and capture towns in your rear. Uh, and it happened pretty frequently and it was extremely frustrating. Um, all right, well, let's watch Army of the Mississippi is retreating that away. And I'm gonna bring Grant and the Army of the Tennessee by rail to Memphis. I'm also going to move my river fleet as fast as it can go, horse march, all the way up to the Mississippi River. I may actually have to dispatch Kearney to Dyersburg to make sure that my supply depot uh, remains sound. Of course, all this for a tiny army of like 15,000 men. All right, my Mississippi squadron didn't see anything. McDowell is safely ensconced in Cairo. I'm gonna bring the fleet back down here. See if I can get some intelligence, get some line of sight against what may be going on. In the meantime, I'm going to head back east, check things out. Time has advanced a little bit. It's April 20th, 1862. Things on the peninsula are going swimmingly, I have to say. And we have found the Army of Mississippi. <laughs> it tried to zip away uh, over here, and uh, we've, we found it parked on the other side of the Mississippi River. So I probably didn't need to rush back to defend my lines, but I wanted to. So we still have Nashville, we still control Nashville. That's pretty good. I would like to make a move on Corinth if I can, but I don't want to do that until I've dealt with the army of Mississippi here. Now they have 13,000 men. Their morale is likely pretty low. I've, I outnumber them significantly with Kearney. So I think I'm just going to cross Kearney right over here and just come and, uh, no, use the river. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to bring Kearney across, uh, and I'm going to go after him. So that should be that. Uh, and I'm hoping... Oh, they're moving again. Where are they going? So again, you know, after you make the core, like I've said before, oh, maybe I haven't mentioned it in this campaign, but it, it seems like the orders actually take so much longer. And one of the advantages they, you know, is so-called is that the orders are, should go faster. <laughs> um, but it's because like, Kearney's orders come from Grant and Grant's far away and they don't have a telegraph between the two of them. So he had to like send a runner you know, send like a dude to go down and like give the orders to Kearney. And now Kearney's going to march off and I'm actually going to give him just the order to stop. Uh, and yeah, so they are withdrawing and they've run into some of my men. Good. That's where I want them to go. Uh, because yeah, if I can come down here and capture Little Rock, I think that will basically pull all of the confederate forces south rather than keeping them up here in missouri and that would be pretty ideal i don't know that i want to make a move on little rock now i think what i want to do is i want to bring kearney down to make a move onto corinth and there might be another secessionist army around here as well. There were two of them. But I think, too, that we're going to need another force. So this is the army of Tennessee. It probably should be the army of the Tennessee. But I think I want at least another corps, at least another 15,000, 20,000 men that I want to headquarter in Nashville. And I want to keep them sort of on my eastern flank as we go in. I might also want to send them over here. Now, the Confederacy has an iron mine near Knoxville. It is the, this is it. This is their only iron mine. The entire Confederacy, this is their only iron mine. And if I build another core, 
headquartered in Nashville and send a even a cavalry raiding force up up here the uh I guess this is still is this still the Shenandoah Valley I know this is what is this one the Appalachian Valley so if I if I send a raiding force up the Appalachian Valley I might be able to torch this iron mine and that would be a huge setback for the economy of the Confederacy so that's something to think about that might be a nice long-term plan and I think I think I'm gonna try to raise that uh, that second that other core here. So we got to come to the military panel, and you can say new independent core, and you bring that up. And I'm gonna pick. I want to build it in Kentucky. And I actually this is perfect. This is exactly who I wanted to be in charge. George Thomas. George Thomas is a Virginian. George Thomas uh, was born in Virginia. He stayed loyal to the United States during the war, and he was a superb, superb commander for the Union side. Uh, and he's, he's often sort of gone unsung in many things. I'm just going to give him two divisions. That's all I want. Tyler's okay. Thomas Williams is all right. I think I'm going to replace him. Joseph Roberts. Milroy. I thought I had more sort of displaced uh, brigadiers uh, around somewhere, but I guess not. McLarenand. I can bring McLarenand in here. He's an Illinoisan. He was uh, another one of these political appointees that helped kind of keep Southern Illinois especially uh, a little bit more loyal. So, yeah, let's do McLarenand. And then, uh, let's see. I can transfer a few men from... I don't want Burnside. I've got the Department of the Missouri. I'm going to bring Abercrombie over. He's a veteran. So I definitely want Abercrombie. And how are these? These are two full cavalry brigades. So I'm going to bring them in under McLarenand. And these two Iowan brigades. We got Kansas. Oh, that's our first Kansas. Let's give him some veteran artillery as well. I'll give him Sykes. Oh boy, this is uh, really badly understaffed. Okay, that'll be it for now. I'm going to let these guys transfer over. It'll be about 10 days or so. Um, and I'll see about... Let's see if we've got nobody I really want to spare from out east. We do have the Army of the Ohio that I might kind of move over to be a bit farther to the west. We'll see. But yeah, this tiny little division here, this is gonna be this is gonna be the kind of core of our first thing. Let's 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 rename these guys. These are at least the third Ohio cavalry. I know I've got a few more. Um and I believe these are the 2nd Missouri Cavalry as well. I think I've got at least one more. All right. This is this is okay. Um, and eventually, so I'm going to call this the Army of Kentucky for now. And let's see where they ended up. Cairo. Here they are. Okay. So they're just in Covington. So I'm going to have him move. All right, they've got... Army of West Tennessee. I'm going to move him to... I'm going to just take it, have him ride the train straight to Nashville. Um, his, his men are going to transfer over pretty quickly, and I want him in theater. I'm probably also going to make... Rather than have him as an independent corps, I'm going to rope him over here to Grant's Corps. Either Grant's Corps or the Western Department, or the Missouri Department, I'm not sure. Probably Grant, because I think eventually I'm going to have him come a little bit farther west and come down with us toward the Mississippi. I also want to take this opportunity to introduce the fact that we have some naval presence down here uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have the Gulf Blockading Squadron, and this is... Uh, they're doing all right, I suppose. Um, they are, of course, in... Uh, they are in blockade mode. 
they're blockading at least for the Biloxi port. That's pretty good. Um, or at least they should be. Uh, and I've got another. I've got another naval squadron heading over here as well. This is what I've what I'm calling the steam squadron. These are all steamboats, and I'm going to try to use this to blockade the ports around New Orleans. Oh, uh oh. Now, how are you gonna? How are you gonna tell me that I'm gonna have a battle here in Nashville when this army doesn't exist and this army doesn't exist? So I'm, I'm gonna withdraw. George Thomas. Where'd he go? Wow, he teleported. He went to Savannah. That's pretty bizarre. Uh, and he ran into this other army of the Mississippi. This is so weird. But I did suspect that there was a force that was going to be marching over here to Nashville. So I am glad that I actually sent Thomas that way. Um... And it looks like, again, we're going to have to fight this army over here. They're building up to be something pretty big, too. I'm glad I've at least kind of stirred up... Seems like I've stirred up the Western Hornet's Nest down this way. So let's move Grant over to meet Kearney. Because I'm going to want all of my forces concentrated here. And, you know, if, if it turns out that in the f next few days I'm able to get... Thomas in here as well and get some more experience for his little army then I'm going to do that so while we let that run let's let's check out our finances like we tend to do uh treasury balance we're up to 50 million that's pretty good our interest rate is down to 6.27 percent we are at a surplus of only negative 47 million we're making total revenues of 831 million per year that's pretty good um I've seen quite a few other people with much higher sales tax than I have. And I don't know 100% why, but my tariffs are incredibly high, which is pretty great. So finances are doing okay. Uh, I am going to check out. Okay, they're still in economic straits. They're still not making as much money as they ought to be. And they're still underproducing bronze. So I think I'm going to come up here and I'm going to upgrade the cliff copper mines using my industry subsidies. So this is going to take 30 days, 60 days, 67 days, uh, and we should have more copper. And again, it's, you know, the, the copper is actually going to go, uh, watch this, the flow. Oh, I can't even see. It just goes to the port. So let me see if I can get the port. Copper ore... It's not even saying it's doing anything. I can't click on that. That's too bad. Uh, but yeah, this might actually go down to this port and then the rail back to Chicago. We'll see. Um, we've also got these foundries over here with the same problems, right? They're underproducing bronze to the amount of copper they're bringing in. So if, who knows, maybe if we produce more copper, uh, we might end up producing a, a bit more bronze. We'll see. Thomas withdrawing. Well, yeah. Okay. So there are a billion armies. And he's just zipping, teleporting across the country. Okay. Sure. But here comes Kearney. And here comes Grant. And it looks like we're going to have another, another brawl over here against the Army of the Mississippi. Union buys back bonds. Let's check that out. I don't think I've ever seen this one. Union today bought back 25 million worth of bonds on the public debt markets at a current interest level of 6.19%. Huge surpluses and a filled treasury supported this transaction. Total debt outstanding was reduced to 364 million, while the nation has a current rating of BBB plus. Interesting. So yeah, when you have a budget surplus, uh, yeah, we had 50 million before we bought back 25 million dollars worth of bonds, and you know, in real life, I don't know exactly how it works in the mechanics of the game, but in real life, that would basically mean that your 
you encourage more people to buy bonds to help keep your treasury filled because it means they're going to make their money back. Um, you know, they're certainly going to make their money back. And uh, just before we enter into a battle, since we're looking at some of this stuff, let's look at some of our projects that we have. Infrastructure reform is always a good one to go to, I think. Perhaps market reform. Increase the efficiency of the nation's markets. I don't have too many of them, though. What I'd really like to do is subsidize ag and do farm mechanization, but I don't nearly have enough ag subsidies to put into that yet. Don't really need to counter propaganda. My state support's all pretty good. Railroad construction, possible. Occupation administration. Each level of this project will further increase support of our nation. Conquered states and territories. Interesting. I could do Sharps Rifles. Everybody loves Sharps Rifles. Logistics Reforms. Yeah, is a level. Reduce cost of troop moving. I'm going to do this. So that, that wiped out our military budget, but it'll come back up pretty, pretty well. So this means that we're going to be spending less money on maintaining our forces, especially if they're moving around rivers and rails, uh, which is what many of them are doing. So... Uh, we've got that going for us. So we spent some subsidies. We have a ton of industry subsidies. We have almost 10 million. I'm going to put these into upgrading mines and upgrading other sort of industry relevant buildings. In fact, let me look. Okay. Hot, super high priority for markets. I'm going to put a couple of those down as well. Let's see what about these. Okay. High priority of farms, high priority of foundries, high priority of ironworks. But all of my ironworks and foundries are running like they're not they're not doing well. <laughs> uh, lumber mills, everything. Jeez. But yeah, it's, it's weird that it keeps saying, you know, high priority for this stuff, but all the, the things, all the ones that we already have are not profitable. I might, it might be worth putting a factory or something in Cairo. Let's see. Whenever you want to put down, I've got a ton of workforce. No, no available capital, no market influences. Uh, some of these are a little weird. Production demand. Well, I want to build a couple of buildings. So let's see. I'm going to try, let's do a factory. And this comes from, it's four and a half million. It comes from our industry subsidies. And so when you hit approve, right, you get this and it brings up this panel to the right. And where you hover it, where you say you want to put it, it says price level of the sold goods is expensive. Price level of pre-goods above average. And it tells you the available workforce. So you want the sold goods to be higher than the pre-goods because that means it'll be more profitable. You also want a high available workforce. And this actually looks like a perfect place to put a factory. So I'm going to put a factory. I'm going to see if I can find a, you know, sort of an ideal perfect spot here. No, it's all going to be about the same. There we go. Uh, all right. So factory is going up there. Our industry subsidies. 
And I've got enough subsidies that I can put... I could put another one down. Jeez. Oh, man, salt works, plantations. I want... I, I need everything. Um, and I am going to put down a federal building. I'm going to put a market down in Cairo as well. And this should help sort of keep things... Sort of improve its transportation network around this way. And there we go. So that's that's a bunch of money spent. Hopefully it's a good one. <laughs> Hopefully it's a good amount of money spent. Uh, but the market will will surely help things out here in Cairo. And I think that, that uh, factory will help things out a little bit as well. So let's get back to it. We've got a battle impending. I need the second core to get a move on. I did order them all the way down here. Why did they stop? And it's going to take 11 hours for that order to get there. That's so ridiculous. Oh. Alright, so my second core are Army of Tennessee. Weapons are delivered. What weapons? 12 pounder Napoleons. All right, I'm going to have to try to wait 17 hours to wait for Grant to arrive because I don't think I can defeat the Army of the Mississippi on my own. Okay, so meeting engagement, or what the game says is a meeting engagement. Uh, again, I think there's a big difference between that mechanic and the actual reality, and we're in this horrible battlefield again. Um, also, it appears as if uh, a number of things are happening here. So one, this is gonna this is gonna be the weirdest battle of all time. The Army of Tennessee wasn't supposed to be here yet. Uh, we were not supposed to be on the field at all. Uh, I was supposed to have seventeen hours before they arrived, and apparently that ain't the case. But I do have Grant's several divisions and his cavalry arm. over here. The capture point is way down here, and I have my whole army on the field. So get out of the way. I just want to find Kearney. There he is. Second core. So because this map sucks, because this map is the worst map, one of the worst maps of all time, it's going to take hours for, for Kearney's Second Corps to come anywhere close to this battlefield. And because of my deployment zone over here, I'm basically going to be kind of forced to fight these guys almost right off the jump. So I could attempt to be hyper, hyper, hyper aggressive and just line straight up right in front of them and just blast them to hell as quickly as I can. But I think that might be a bad move. Um, they do. They outnumber me. Uh, we're up, we're almost even in in this uh, you know in this particular spot. We're almost even. And I could do this, and I could hope. Uh, this man, this is bizarre. And I could hope that my uh, uh, that is a bad place. I want my artillery all in the center. I should finish talking about what I'm talking about first. Um, so let's, okay, McCall here, you there, Crook, over this way. Oh, this way, yep. Um, so the question I have to ask myself is, can I put enough firepower on these units here that have low morale to convince them to withdraw early? If I can do that in the first couple of minutes, I can win this battle with super light casualties and not have to worry about pretty much their entire left wing. If I can't do that, then I'm boned because I'm going to, and I'm going to have to start withdrawing. I'm going to have to start kind of moving, making this very complicated withdrawal until I can get Kearney's second division to come along this confusion of roads and back me up. However, I'm now role-playing as Ulysses S. Grant. 
and Ulysses S. Grant didn't fuck around. And I think that U.S. Grant would, if he had the, the, the opportunity, as is presented here, to beat the living crap out of a secessionist force in the woods. And, and sort of like, you know, we can call this kind of like almost like a surprise attack, right? They, they are not in a good position. Uh, they are, because of the sort of vagaries of this game's sort of deployment, um, mechanics, because we have, we can, we can kind of run right up on them on this, in this deployment zone, and we can put a lot of fire on them really early. Uh, I think that this is an opportunity that that Grant would would not would not give up. And the risk that I'm taking here, once again, the risk that I'm taking here is getting Grant's entire army destroyed. Is is the risk that I'm taking? Uh, it's a big risk. It is a not insignificant risk at all. And I'm really just hoping that this little line of th of four brigades can convince these these wavering brigades here to run soon that's the whole thing and i do have a pretty it looks like i've got a, a moderate advantage in uh morale i've got a big advantage in manpower but i can't manifest it here i can't i can't put it in right i don't i don't actually have the the advantage in manpower yet because kearney's second uh core isn't actually sort of in a place where they can do anything yet. Right? But, again, if I can put a lot of fire on these guys really early, right at the beginning of the battle, and just really pour it into them, I might be able to win straight off. I'm not going to be able to use my artillery all that much. I'm going to keep them close just in case they can fire. But if, if they can't fire over the heads of these guys, I'm going to withdraw them back down this road. Because I uh, I will need to use this road to withdraw. And I'm going to have to get... Uh, and I'm going to have to get Kearney moving as soon as I can. So let's pause. Find Kearney. First, try to get this organized, right? Get my cavalry division to move there first. Give them double time orders. And uh, give my first division to just move up here. And I'm going to have to wait to order my second uh, division. Because otherwise, they will clog the roads. Uh, so I'm just going to order them to move there. Okay. Let's see if we can do them. Artillery is firing. I'll get skirmishers to head up this way as well. Can, I think it'd be super lovely to be able to put a bombard order over here. We'll see if it actually functions. I don't know. And we'll also see if they uh, just cavalry charge. Okay, there's one broken unit. Sam's regiment broken. Johnson's regiment's wavering, taking 70 casualties. It's uh, two broken infantry brigades. I'm moving the 1st Missouri Light uh, back. I'm going to order them back. I do not want them to break. Another broken cavalry brigade. I've only inflicted a couple of hundred casualties, but it's broken, broken artillery battalion.
question is going to have to be, is this enough? Is it going to be enough for me to break just three or four kind of early? Missouri light. These guys are separated. This is Kearney's artillery. So he's got to wait for his orders to come across all of Tennessee, basically, <laughs> before he's actually able to move. That's that's one of the reasons why he's so uh, he, his morale is so nervous. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get him to limber up for now. And. Yeah, we're we're still we're, this is still in the balance here. This is still definitely not a sure thing. I haven't inflicted too many casualties, but I am wearing pretty hard on the morale. They've dropped by nearly ten points. I forgot how green most of the uh, most of, of Grant's army is here. None of almost none of them have perks. This was uh, a much bigger risk than I thought. I mean, if this were my my sort of hardened, I guess it'd be Kearney's men. Kearney's men are the ones that are really experienced. Um, and if I had, had Kearney's division. Kearney's core in this deployment zone rather than Grant's, I think this would have been even more of a sure thing. I mean, I, I'm pretty certain that we've got it right now. I, I've got, like, really no morale risks at the moment at all. Uh, I've taken extremely light casualties, and the Confederate morale is in the dumpster uh, at the moment. So I think we've got this. I'm pretty certain at this point that we've got it. But I think it, it may have even been more of a more of a sure thing. Yep, enemy is withdrawing. We've got this minor victory. I don't think there's any way that we're going to be able to to turn this into a major victory, unfortunately. But like always, right? You order your men to advance and just pour fire into them wherever you can. Yep, and that is one badly beaten enemy army. Again, the casualty ratio is way too light to make this a major victory, but all of these brigades in their next battle, as long as the next battle happens pretty soon, are going to be massively, massively affected uh, in terms of their morale. And so, you know, this is this was a, a convincing you know, a, a terrific victory for Grant. Let's see if I can. No, skirmishers don't want to listen. All right, we've driven those off. Uh, we've probably captured most of their guns. You know, they'll just have their little six pounders back next time. But yeah, nine percent casualties. Less than one percent for our side. I'll take that any day of the week. That was a pretty good victory. Victory at Jackson. 
Captured uh, a little over a thousand rifles and 25 guns. Pretty good. Pretty good. So that was a bit weird, right? The 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 way that the core interacts on the battle map can be weird sometimes, right? It said that it took 17 hours for the second core to arrive. Or rather, they attacked the second core, but it was my, you know, it was Grant's men in the Army of the Tennessee. And Grant's basically his his core that he's leading that that took the brunt of that attack. And Kearney was the one that was far away. So when you organize by core, it's, you know, things get weird. <laughs> things get really strange. And uh, you have to really, you know, you can't really trust that kind of initial deployment thing uh, at all. Because, you know, again, it, it gets pretty weird. So... All right, so that was fine. That was a good battle. I mean, I think that some people might say that the kind of lining up right there in that crunched up deployment zone is kind of cheese, um, especially because the AI clumps their units together so badly. But given the terrain, given my advantage in manpower, given the fact that I control this region pretty closely, the way that I would fictionalize that is by saying that this was essentially an ambush, right? We were able to catch the Army of the Mississippi on the march, uh, we're able to catch them, you know, it was one of these meeting engagements where we just had more men on the field first before they did, and we were able to intercept them as they were marching toward another objective. And, you know, that kind of thing happened all the time in the Civil War. So I don't feel necessarily as if that's super duper cheesy. Uh, other people might disagree, and they're welcome to. But for now, I, I'll say that's a, a comfortable victory that I will take any day of the week. Uh, all right, so I want to move against this army of West Tennessee. It has zero men. It's just forming up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move back to Memphis first because I know that this army of Mississippi will likely be moving down here. They're also trying to recruit, trying to recruit a lot more men <laughs> into the army of the Mississippi here. They want to get this thing up to 30,000 men. Right now they have 22,000. Uh, so I want to harry this as much as possible. And I want to get them shuffling away. I'm still really annoyed about the second core here having a 12-hour order delay. I think that's pretty ridiculous. Especially given that I could give the order to the Army of Kentucky right now. And it would instantly move. It would move within a few hours. But I can't. I have to wait. So I have to wait at least a day. For, I'll have three brigades, two cavalry, and an infantry brigade, uh, you know, actually physically on the field. And I'll move over here to protect Nashville. It looks like their route of march is different than I expected. I might move them back here to this rail junction. And Kearney's just now starting to move. 12 hours later. Grant a destination. Farragut a destination. Steam Squadron down south. So let's pause again. And let's go check out Steam Squadron. So the Gulf Blockading Squadron, it's showing that the Biloxi port and the Mobile port, not the New Orleans port, which is probably the more important one, uh, it's showing that they're blockaded. But unless 1.06 has changed it, it's not actually indicating the level of the blockade status that we have blocked by 9%. That's on this sort of left here, this green you're blocked by 9%. That's not very good. So I'm going to bring the Steam Squadron up here as well. And I'm going to order them to blockade as well. And so we've got eight ships. Well, technically we have two, apparently. Let me take a look at this fleet. Um, yeah, we're waiting for a few of these ships to be completed. So right now we've got basically two frigates. Or we've got a, a USS Santee, a frigate, and the USS Prable. Uh, that are currently 
good in doing the blockade. That's why the blockade is so small. Farragut, on the other hand, has seven ships, all of which are steam powered, all of which are good. And as soon as I put him on blockade, it'll probably increase the level of blockade significantly. I'm going to do that. I'm going to order blockade. I know the Gulf blockading squadron is an automatically generated squadron that starts when the war starts, and it starts assembling over here in Key West. Um, so I moved it from Key West, obviously, to get it over here to start blockading New Orleans as soon as I could. But obviously, it's not ready. Its firepower is very low. Uh, and luckily, the Sasash don't have really any, any, any naval forces up here to speak of to do anything. Uh, I could try to do the Farragut thing of blowing these forts out of the water and just walking some Marines into New Orleans. And who knows? Maybe I will try that. There are tons of forts down here, though. So... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I want to try that quite so much, but there is a possibility that I might try to do some marine shenanigans uh, a little bit. So we'll see. So pretty instantly with the steam squadron doing the blockading, the blockade condition has run up from 9% to 48%. So that uh, it made a, a huge difference. So cool. We Well, we got Farragut down here. Uh, ready to support our moves down the Mississippi River. Uh, the campaign is going really, really well in the Mississippi region. And I'm probably going to tank Corinth, Mississippi pretty soon. And uh, as soon as I get... And here we go. Yeah, I've got I've got most of my uh, force here. I'm actually going to move George Thomas to Nashville to secure it. And I'm going to push the Army of East Tennessee out of the way. Because they actually have no men. They're just trying to form this up. Uh, and as soon, I'm going to have Kearney come and join Grant over here, and they're both going to move together onto Corinth. So I'd like to take that, even if it's just a distraction. I want to take the supply depot and then burn it down. Uh, and I want to, again, keep shoving shoving these armies southward and southward and southward. I want to push them like a skirmisher screen down toward the south. And yeah, it looks like they're bringing all, the, uh, all their best dudes out here front lines are still changing just because i i would really like to make all of this blue right but but uh that's going to be supply difficult so i'm gonna actually going to give Fremont's frontier core it's uh advantage in traveling without supplies and i'm gonna have them move down to springfield <clears throat> This is just my ADD. Nobody needs to do any of this. Uh, but yeah, so we're we're actually seeing a, sort of a massive increase in the complexity of the this region's forces and the operations that it's going to to entail. So that's uh, I think that's pretty cool. It's a it's a I think this has been a sort of a neat experiment in the campaign so far. But let's watch a couple of other things happen. Let's watch uh, Thomas kick out this mustering army. From Nashville and it looks like they're trying to build a supply depot which they can't do because you know they don't actually have any men yep there they go Kearney has arrived. All right, I'm going to order the second corps to move on Corinth first. Now that they are really close to Grant, the order delay is much smaller, as you can see. And I think that if we were to take a third perk, it might it might be useful to take the field telegraph perk because that might actually shorten the order delay uh, coming from Grant. I'm not 100% sure. It might. Uh, it's it's something to experiment with, I think. So let's uh, let's see if we can capture Corinth. Just moving Grant down here to support. We might run into the enemy. We might not. I'm not sure. Uh, they're not super close, and they are withdrawing. Looks like they are withdrawing. And both of them, for some reason unknown to me, have stopped. I don't want them to do that. I want them to keep marching. Is 
this one is... I don't want to build this if I can avoid it. And it looks like the enemy force has moved down the rail line. Yep, and once again, pushing those uh, morale-drained armies out of the way. Capturing Corinth, and I wonder if they might try to withdraw down the river. No, we're going to have to chase them around like chicken with our heads cut off over and over. <clears throat> this is a situation in which I wish the AI allowed more surrendering. Right? These, these guys are badly pinched. They either have to withdraw down the river. What I would probably try to do is take the river to Decatur, and then I'd, I'd march from Decatur down to, like, you know, Tuscaloosa or somewhere else that I could get sort of deeper into my own country and, you know, recover. Uh, the AI is not, is it, ain't doing that, though. Uh, and that's fine. I mean, I think we'll give this a couple of days, and what I'd like to do is is hit them again if I can. And I might even bring Thomas down to try to do that. But Thomas is will be severely outnumbered by the Army of the Mississippi, which has about 20,000 men, and they're going toward 30,000. And I really don't want that army to to come and deal with with George Thomas. He's just he's 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 undermanned as far as this goes. So with that respect, I'm actually let's let's get some more men recruited into the Department of Missouri. Let's add a new group. Let's find somebody who's a good administrator. Timothy Andrews is pretty good. I'm not sure I'm going to find anybody that's got three in administration at this late stage of the war. So I'll take Andrews. And uh, I'm just going to give him just a few more infantry brigades uh, from, around, from around here. So... Missouri, I can do a mid-sized infantry brigade. Michigan's got enough. I can do a mid-sized infantry brigade. Illinois can just barely do another infantry brigade and let's see if I can get another one from Indiana nope they are tapped out what about Iowa they are also tapped out Kansas tapped out and uh, I'll take one from Pennsylvania yeah well from Pennsylvania they'll be sort of the eastmost men that we have here but mcdowell will raise that little second core right here in uh, the department of missouri i don't think they have formed an independent core anywhere so yeah that's good uh and fremont is almost here in springfield so let's check out the front lines yeah and he's looking good uh, he's got such a small force and they've got that supply perk the flying column so i think that uh, his supply problems aren't going to be that major uh, compared to to other marches that we've had. Move Fremont all the way to Carroll. Or Carrollton. There's a supply depot over here I can capture. And the enemy armies are moving away. So it, I think it's a safe move. But then again, you know, if Fremont gets into trouble... That's kind of Fremont's whole whole game. Oh, Western Army. Moving pretty quickly. Moving on the rail. I'll take my second core and head down and see if I can hit them. And I have a, a perk to think about to give to Grant. So the, the things I'm thinking about, embedded reporters, uh, I'd like to make sure that none of my brigadiers get too big for their britches or my soldiers start thinking that they deserve better officers when they are none in the entire Union Army. This might help to increase fame. 
I'm obviously thinking about Field Telegraph because the order delays with this core is it's just ridiculous. It's just absolutely absurd. Um, Bureau of Military Intelligence is always a good one. Field or Ambulance Corps is always a really good one. I'm going to go with Field Telegraph. I'm going to try that out. I don't often do that because I don't often actually have the core structure, to be honest. The Western Army is moving. They are getting out of there. I'm going to turn Kearney right around. In 13 hours, he'll get his orders to turn around and come back. Just ridiculous. Uh, McCray's army. Again, absolutely no men at all. None whatsoever. Are somehow going to come and take down my 10,000 man army. All right. They're, they're welcome to, to try, I suppose. Let's see where this telegraph is actually connected to. This is a southern telegraph, so it's not actually connected to any of my telegraphs. So I wonder, actually, do I... I don't know that I even... Oh, I do. Okay. Let's look at the telegraph lines strung across the country. Uh, you can turn a map filter on to show that. Part of the reason I might have poor order delays is because I'm operating without any telegraphs whatsoever. So it might be worth it to use I guess this is an independent core uh, that's been formed right on top of them but yeah as, as the the second core here kind of gets recruiting got a few days uh, never mind I'm not gonna move them I'm gonna move McDowell himself McDowell I want you to move here I'm gonna have McDowell's forces build a telegraph Okay, so we can actually come down all the way to Jackson. So I'm going to have him come down to this intersection here. And he's going to build a field telegraph. Or not a field telegraph, a telegraph. Okay, good. I'm glad I moved Kearney again. I really don't want to fight on the Tennessee battlefield again, if I can avoid it. I'm really hoping this army just gets pushed away like all the other ones have. Because the sooner I get away from this, from these jungle maps, uh, in my opinion, the better. But we've got to watch out for the Western Army. We've got to watch out for the Army of Mississippi. We've got to watch out for the Missouri State Guard. How's Fremont doing? Fremont's doing okay. He's also scouting. Pushing the front lines back. I think uh, some action was happening on the peninsula when I wasn't paying attention. Um, so while... Alright, McDowell has arrived. Going to have him order Telegraph. Right there. I had recorded the next uh, chunk of this episode, intending to put it in this episode, but looking at the time here, I think we're going to call it here. So once again, thank you very much for watching, and the next episode we're going to have another couple of battles that start off right away. So I'll see you next time. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you really like what you're seeing, feel free to leave a comment. Give me a like or a subscribe, and if you have any questions about anything in particular you'd like to see covered, please let me know. See you next time.